In this lecture, we move from the right to vote as participation in expressive association to the right to vote as an aggregative right. As was mentioned in the introductory lecture, you can infringe on the right to vote by preventing people from voting, by determining what uh, they see on the ballot, but also in how you aggregate votes together. Uh, so this uh, lecture is the beginning of a series of lectures on redistricting and gerrymandering. Um, and the question here is not about preventing people from voting, but it's about uh, diluting their vote. And so you can dilute the vote of, of individuals in many different ways. You can uh, malapportion districts by having some districts be much larger than others. Um, or you could uh, intentionally gerrymander districts to discriminate on the basis of, say, race or uh, political party. Uh, and in, the, in effect, dilute the votes of certain groups. And so, so much of the, uh, the field of election law has been focused on redistricting over the last 40 years, uh, that we deal with uh, gerrymandering in many different uh, incarnations. But I thought I'd start by just pointing out what the word gerrymander means and where it comes from. And so uh, the word gerrymander comes from uh, Elbridge Gerry, who was the governor of Massachusetts, the anti-federalist governor of Massachusetts who drew a district in northern Massachusetts to discriminate against his political opponents. It was a malapportioned district, multi-member district uh, in northern Massachusetts that sort of was a, a curved shape. And some journalists looked at this district and said, oh my gosh, that district looks like a salamander. And one of the journalists next to him said, no, that's not a salamander, that's a gerrymander. Uh, and they created this political cartoon for the original gerrymander. And so the moniker was born and now uh, we describe gerrymandering uh, and use the word gerrymander to describe uh, all kinds of efforts to use the redistricting process to discriminate against identifiable uh, political groups. There are many strategies that you can use in the redistricting process to minimize the votes of particular groups. So let me discuss some of them here as well as uh, some attempts to try to, to deal with uh, these aspects of vote dilution. So first, when it comes to vote dilution, you can um, um, dilute the votes of your political opponents in several different ways. First, you can pack them. And so that means concentrating your opponents into just a few districts. Or you could crack them by spreading your opponents among many districts uh, so that they won't be majorities in any of them. You can also engage in what's known as stacking, which is to combine districts into large at large, uh, into large districts that uh, elect multi, uh, multiple members. So for example, if, uh, you know, if, you're, if you're in, in a town which has four districts and one of them is clearly Republican, uh, three of them are, are majority Democrat, suppose you then eliminated districts and made it four people would be elected from that entire, um, from that entire city, you might then get four Democratic districts instead of having one where, which would be reliably Republican. So that's uh, called stacking. There's also another, uh, another strategy called kidnapping, uh, which is where you draw the districts in such a way as to uh, draw the house of uh, an a incumbent uh, from one district into the uh, district of another person. So you pair up their houses uh, and essentially kidnap an incumbent in order to prevent that incumbent from being able to run from that district. So packing, cracking, stacking, kidnapping, those are all different strategies uh, when it comes to drawing districts. And so now let's talk a little bit about, about the different types of gerrymanders. Uh, first uh, is the partisan gerrymander. And that can take many different forms, but in general, uh, the political party in charge then tries to uh, draw districts that favor uh, its, its uh, candidates and its supporters. So um, if it's a Democratic gerrymander, they'll try to draw as many districts uh, where Democrats are narrowly going to win um, uh, the election. Uh, and to try to minimize the number of districts and Republicans will win. Sometimes that can be achieved by both packing and cracking so that you would pack your opponents into as few districts as possible and crack your supporters into as many districts as possible. Contrast that with what's known as a bipartisan gerrymander. A bipartisan gerrymander, which was actually upheld in, in a case called Gaffney versus Cummings against constitutional challenge, is when the Democrats and Republicans often will collude with each other in order to draw state safe districts. 
And so uh, one way to get a redistricting plan passed um, under conditions of polarization is for the Democrats to say, all right, we're going to shore up the, our districts. The Republicans say, we're going to shore up our districts that, that currently exist, and we're basically going to eliminate competition. And so the Democrats will end up um, having safe dis some safe districts, and the Republicans will also have uh, safe districts. That's somewhat different than an incumbent protecting gerrymander. An incumbent protecting gerrymander is specifically designed in order to further the electoral interests of the of the incumbents themselves. That might be uh, that might be the same as a, a bipartisan gerrymander if um, if the incumbents actually are driving that process. But sometimes incumbents actually like the districts that they currently have, even if they are somewhat more competitive than ones which might take them far afield. So I've been involved in redistricting plans, for example, where Republicans object even to new Republicans or Democratic candidates object to new districts, even though they might be safe for them, because it ends up giving them a lot of new voters and a lot of new territory. Maybe they're worried about a primary election challenge. And so an incumbent protecting gerrymander really focuses on the interests of the incumbents themselves as to what they want. It's worth talking about, you know, a fifth feature of your option when it comes to gerrymandering, and that is what many people would say would be do the right thing. Um, um, some kind of nonpartisan strategy, uh, take the manipulation out of the process, either by coming up with specific criteria, like promoting compactness, contiguity, respect for political subdivision lines so that you draw districts that are more circular or square or, and, or that overlap with county lines. That's one set of uh, criteria that you'll often see in the law. Respecting communities of interest, uh, however we define them, which we'll discuss in, in later lectures. Promoting competition or avoiding bias or promoting responsiveness, all kinds of uh, values when it comes to um, uh, making sure that people's votes matter and they're not completely determined by the gerrymandering process. Or sometimes um, uh, courts in particular, when they adopt plans, will adopt the least change plan, which is to uh, make sure that the, the, the districts stay as consistent over time as possible. In all of these cases that we're going to discuss, though, and, and thinking about the strategies that uh, incumbent parties might participate in, you also have to think about what happens if they do nothing. Uh, because if the parties do nothing, then the courts are going to get involved because someone will sue in order to uh, make sure that the lines comply with one person, one vote. And so a, an old redistricting plan is usually going to be unconstitutional. And so if you fail to come up with, if this, the incumbents fail to come up with a new redistricting plan, that means the courts are going to step in uh, and draw their own. And that's quite important because if you think about how the negotiating process will work in a, in a redistricting situation, it's often the case that parties will be thinking about whether the, the, the plan that is on offer is better or worse than the one that they're likely to get uh, from a court where the court does to come into the process. Just by way of uh, displaying how these different strategies of packing or cracking would work in the redistricting process, I thought I'd put up a map from uh, 2002, um, and the, a racial map of, uh, of Fulton and, and DeKalb County. This is the area around Atlanta uh, in Georgia. And to talk about how uh, packing, cracking might work in a, in a concrete circumstance. So you see in, in this map that there are areas that are very dark green where you have close to 80 to 100 percent African-American concentration uh, in those precincts. The much lighter green areas, you might have zero to 20, the much whiter areas where it's zero to 20 percent uh, white. And so how you draw lines uh, in a city like this will often determine whether you're going to have a majority black voters in a district or majority uh, white voters in a district. And if there are conditions of racial polarization, meaning that blacks and whites are voting for different candidates, it will the redistricting process will often um, be dispositive in determining um, wh which community is going to have representation. Because if you draw the districts uh, completely within the city, where you could end up, you could end up drawing nine, 80 or 90 percent uh, African-American uh, districts if you uh, keep them um, the, the districts wholly within the city. Similarly, if they go out into the suburbs and go out quite far, you could dilute the African-American vote by making sure they're less than 30 percent uh, in a district. And so part of the challenge as we think about the proper way of redistricting is to think about, well, what is the 
um, optimal way to represent communities. Uh, what is sort of the Goldilocks principle here of making sure you're not over concentrating or under concentrating communities uh, so that they can elect their candidates of choice? Or should we not factor in, you know, whether it's questions of race or party at all and just focus on other kinds of values like compactness, contiguity, respect uh, for political subdivision or other kinds of criteria like that. By way of introduction to the redistricting process, uh, I thought it'd be useful to talk about uh, what line drawers have at their disposal when they are creating a redistricting plan. So the, the kind of critical input to drawing lines uh, for redistricting is the census data, something called the PL94171 data file. Uh, this is the, uh, the PL refers to the public law. This is the required data that the census must collect in order uh, to promote the redistricting process and to facilitate the redistricting process for all levels of government. And I, and I should emphasize that because of the one person, one vote rule, for all levels of government, we engage in redistricting every 10 years once we have the census. That's true for the smallest school board as it is for congressional districts. And so the PL94171 data file uh, includes the basic data that you need in order to do redistricting, as well as to comply uh, with the Voting Rights Act. And so that includes aggregate population, literally the number of inhabitants in a particular location. And inhabitants includes ineligible voters like children, people who aren't citizens, uh, people who are in prison, uh, and the like. Um, but it also breaks down the data according to voting age population and race and ethnicity, uh, so that you know how many people are over the age of 18, because that would be important to think about in, in thinking about their uh, voting power. And then both aggregate population and voting age population are broken down by race and Hispanic origin. Hispanic origin is actually not seen as a racial category on the census, it's a separate question. And so the census asks you uh, whether you are white, black, Native American, uh, uh, or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, uh, Asian or some other race, and then separately asks whether you identify as Hispanic Latino or not. And uh, from those different combinations, the, um, the census uh, distributes at all levels of geography down to the smallest neighborhood, um, the racial and ethnic makeup of the U.S. population that then you can use in redistricting. And that's all that is contained uh, in the census file in time for redistricting. And so there are all, there's all kinds of other information that you'd, you'd like to have probably to describe the population it, with that level of granularity. Um, but because the legal requirements are such that the Voting Rights Act requires that you uh, sometimes look at race and the one person, one vote rule requires that you have the aggregate population data, that is what the, the census provides in that decennial census file. Now, there's all kinds of other data that you can get from the census and others. There's something called the American Community Survey, which includes a lot, which is a survey, not a census, uh, which where a certain percentage of households every year will fill out that survey that has information about citizenship. It has information about um, other characteristics like of the home and wealth and, and other uh, status questions. Um, but when it comes to the decennial census data that we use for redistricting, it's really total population, voting age population as broken down by race and Hispanic origin. But of course, that's not enough uh, in order to draw a redistricting plan. You need a lot of information about uh, the area. And so um, the, the population is one input, but you want to know uh, where different lines are. So you have uh, those of us who draw lines uh, have information about the geography of a particular area. That's certainly the political subdivision lines, everything from precinct boundaries to the county boundaries, to the municipal boundaries, water district boundaries, all kinds of things about uh, political subdivisions. Depending on the state, they'll have different types of um, boundaries uh, that, that will be available. Um, you have the old district lines, um, the ones that uh, were in the previous plan or in other kinds of plans, such as you know, state legislature, school board, uh, congressional districts, and others. You also have all the, all the same kind of features that you'd have in something like Google Maps or a, a GIS program, Geographic Information System program. You have all the topographical features, where mountains are, where rivers are, where railroads are, highways, uh, and other uh, modes of transportation are all, are all there. And, and all of these might be useful as kind of um, guideposts as to where to draw district lines that so that people can have some familiarity 
as to uh, where, where one district ends and one district uh, begins. And so you have all that, that information about the geography. And then in some circumstances, particularly if the political parties are drawing the districts, you'll have different kinds of political data. So you'll have election returns from recent elections that uh, might be broken down by the precinct, and then we might make um, disaggregate them even down to the census blocks. Um, you'd have party registration data. You might have the location of incumbents residents in a particular uh, area so that you could, if, if you're trying to protect incumbents in districts, that those districts could be drawn so that you don't pair incumbents residences with each other. And so different actors are going to have more or less sophisticated data with respect to all of this. The political parties, the party insiders, often develop models of, of what is known as the normal vote, where they try to predict, well, what is the average Democrat or the average Republican, uh, how, they're, how are they going to perform in a given district, given everything we know about past elections? And so you uh, average out or otherwise factor in previous election successes in that particular area to come up with a prediction about how Democrats and Republicans might do uh, in that particular census block. And then you build the district together from those census blocks and precincts in order to create a district. And then you can predict uh, what the likely outcome is uh, politically as to who's going to win. Finally, you have all kinds of information about the communities who are going to be represented in particular areas. Some of this is actual data, like you might know church attendance in particular areas, or you might know um, other kinds of associations like union membership, um, or you may have data, say, data uh, sources uh, from other kinds of political organizations. But you also have just location data about, well, here's where, here's where the sports stadium is. Here's where uh, particular churches are. Here's where the different you know, industrial plants are um, so that you can know which district is going to have different salient features. I've been involved in redistricting plans where the location of the metro stops are, end up being, uh, or subway stops are quite important uh, for particular incumbents or particular districts. Uh, in addition, you might have just anecdotal evidence by, by communities themselves where they say, all right, well, this is this particular area. This is where, for example, um, in Georgia, this is the pan, the peanut country and here's the pecan country um, because there are different sort of types of farms in these different areas. Um, I was, rural and urban is a, a quite important uh, defining community uh, characteristic. And so you'll have different data or different um, inputs into the process uh, based on that. So any any way that you can describe a community might um, find its way into the redistricting process. Now let me introduce uh, the next few lectures and uh, a, way, a framework for thinking about the legal constraints on the redistricting process. And so I want to divide them into federal constitutional constraints, you know, constraints on the U.S. Constitution, uh, constraints under the Voting Rights Act, and then uh, state law constraints that one or another state might have on the redistricting process. So let's start with the U.S. Constitution. As is true with the right to vote cases, uh, much of the constitutional law with respect to redistricting is quite modern, starts with the one person, one vote cases in the 1960s. And so um, the, the restraint there uh, is that districts have to have generally equal populations, as we'll discuss when we go over those cases. Um, there's different requirements for congressional elections than there are for state elections. A much more strict uh, rule of population equality applies to congressional districts than for state districts or non-congressional districts. But the basic uh, constraint, which exists for all levels of government, um, is uh, one person, one vote, that districts have to have equal numbers of people in them. Secondly, there's a prohibition on intentional racial discrimination. As is true for every other state action, you cannot use the redistricting process in a way as to intentionally try to discriminate against a, political, a racial group, right? So if a, a, a legislature or a city council is trying to diminish the power of African Americans, it cannot set out to achieve that uh, result and then um, once it achieves it, it could be subject to litigation under the 14th Amendment, uh, suspect classification prong. Now, the prohibition on intentional racial discrimination is different than a set of cases that we're going to call the Shaw versus Reno line of cases, which are prohibitions on the excessive use of race in the construction of a district. And so whereas in the intentional race-based vote dilution cases, what you're trying to do is injure 
a racial group by minimizing their representation. In the Shaw line of cases, this sort of undue emphasis on, re on race in the redistricting process cases, the issue is whether you've allowed race to become too much of a factor in the construction of the district, and does that violate what the court has seen as a general rule of colorblindness uh, that emanates from the 14th Amendment? And so these are complicated cases, but the bottom line is that the court has come up with rules to say that if, because of the way you've drawn this district, race has become the predominant factor in the construction of that district, it may end up being unconstitutional and violating the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment. Finally, when it comes to constitutional constraints, we might mention one that is no longer a constitutional constraint uh, because of a Supreme Court case called Rucho versus Common Cause in 2019. And that has to do with partisan gerrymandering. Up until that case, there was the possibility, at least, that the court would say that partisan gerrymandering, the intentional discrimination against people on the basis of partisanship in the redistricting process to try to say advantage of the Democrats over the Republicans in a particular area, you might have thought that that would be illegal or unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has said that no, that it presents a non-justiciable political question. You know what non-justiciable means, right? It means it can't be justiced. Uh, that uh, uh, it is not uh, the kind of claim by which you can go in and say that this, uh, you have a claim in court that says that this is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. That was what was hoped uh, prior to Rucho versus Common Cause, but the court said that no, there is no federal constitutional claim with respect to partisan gerrymandering. Second, there, we're going to spend a lot of time on the Voting Rights Act. Let me mention also a now kind of defunct provision of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, which we'll spend an entire lecture on, uh, but it's mainly become a history lesson at this point. There's the possibility that it might be uh, you know, reauthorized by Congress in the future. But Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act required certain jurisdictions around the country, so-called covered jurisdictions, to uh, get permission from the federal government, either the Department of Justice or uh, federal court, before they could enact any uh, voting law or redistricting plan. So Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act applied to voting generally. And so whether it was a you know, the movement of a polling location or a voter ID law uh, or a redistricting plan, you had to get permission from the federal government, the DOJ or uh, federal court. Um, that provision, that, that, that the geographic trigger, the fact that it applied to certain parts of the country with the history of racial discrimination, but not others, that trigger was later uh, struck down as unconstitutional in, in Shelby County versus Holder. Uh, but at the time that it was operational, the, um, the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act prevented what was known as retrogression of, uh, of African-American, Latino, or other minority voting power, meaning that you couldn't uh, draw a districting plan which would end up having a retrogressive effect, making minorities worse off in the redistricting process. And so that was, that was Section 5. What still exists, and though it's, though it's uh, currently, currently going up to the Supreme Court in, in 2022, 2023, uh, is Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And so we'll spend uh, an entire lecture on that, talking about um, the requirement uh, that in some cases you have to pay attention to race in the drawing of districts because a uh, whether it's a districting plan or an at-large election scheme could be illegal under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act if it has a discriminatory impact uh, in minimizing and canceling out the votes of uh, racial minorities. Notice that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is different than the constitutional constraint that prevents intentional race-based vote dilution because the Constitution requires discriminatory purpose. The Voting Rights Act, Section 2, as amended in 1982, was specifically designed to prevent uh, to, to, to make it easier to bring cases, uh, even if there was just a discriminatory impact, not just uh, proving discriminatory intent. So that those are, the, those are the statutory constraints we'll discuss. And then there are state law claims that you need to keep in mind. And the state courts have been quite active in recent years when it comes to uh, redistricting litigation. And different state constitutions have different rules. Some um, require that districts be compact. Others require that they, most of them require that they be contiguous, meaning that they um, connect to each other, right? So you can't have sort of islands uh, within districts uh, uh, connecting to each other. Um, some require respect for political subdivision lines like counties and cities uh, and, and other political subdivisions. And some now require you know, specific constraints with respect to party. 
Some like Florida say that you cannot draw a district that intentionally favors or disfavors a political party uh, or candidate. Uh, so some states require greater partisan fairness. Others require that there be a certain number of competitive districts. That's what Arizona requires, for example. And so uh, different state, state laws uh, have different requirements, sometimes in the Constitution, many of which have been passed by initiative. Some now are being implemented by um, state redistricting commissions as opposed to uh, the incumbents uh, and, and the parties in control, which is uh, the, in general the norm. Um, and so each one of these legal constraints can be very important uh, depending on the context. <laughs>